aren't you just a sight for sore eyes? Of all the movie and TV joints in all the towns and all the world, you walked into mine. How lovely. Come, sit. Let me pour you a drink before we begin the showing. You know, I think that this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Cheers. Here's looking at you, Phil. Well, hello there. How are we? Uh, Welcome back to Here's Looking at You Film, a podcast for the vintage cinephile with modern sensibilities. I'm your host, Nikki, and I am very happy to be back with you this week. Not even going to lie, it has been a rough winter. Um, I'm going to have a little personal moment with you up top, you know. This is my first winter alone in seven years, and my last winter alone seven years ago was in Florida, which is not a bad place to spend your winters, right? Now, don't get me wrong. I love the cold. I love the holidays. I love snow, sweaters, hot chocolate, boots. It's my jam, right? But it is February now, the month of hearts and kisses and social displays of affection. So the days inside where the only cuddle action that I'm getting is with my blanket, I could probably take less of those. So I took a few days off social to decompress and refocus, but I kind of realized that the pod is kind of like my partner. Um, The podcast is always here for me. Um, It's something that I can always work on as a project, but it's never judging me or never really making me feel like I can't do something. It's always there for me to do more and learn more. And uh, also you guys are like my partners. If the pod is like my partner, which means that all of y'all are going to be my Valentine's next week. Yay. So I'm glad that we settled that and I can feel better about life. So I have however many people are listening. Y'all are my Valentine's. Thank you. So now this week is definitely going to be a departure from our regular content. Part of the reason that I started this podcast is because I understand that watching old films can be difficult when they seem so different, so dry, so moral and positive. But have you ever wondered why older films are the way that they are? Like, they were made in a completely different world than ours. And it's not just like the black and white or the clothes, because even as they started to transition into color, the dialogue, the predictable endings, the story arcs, it's all similar, familiar, but very different. And you may be surprised that it's not just a product of the time. Uh, For example, like I watched Sick Nurses on a stream with Kelly from Drunk Theory, a, a podcast that you should definitely be listening to. Okay, so real quick. So it's Kelly, Matt, Kara, and sometimes Ryan, and they just kind of like drink and wax poetic about conspiracies and fun facts. Um, They're they have the best accents in the world or the best voices in the world. Uh, They're so fun to listen to. It's funny, and some of the drinks that Kelly makes are actually excellent in real life. Like I've made a couple of them, and they're actually really good. So. If you want a fun, funny pod to listen to while you clean or cook or drink or do whatever you do, do it. Get on Drunk Theory. Anyway, we watched Sick Nurses and this movie was like, I mean, they found ways to kill people that I had never even thought of in my life. It's it's a Thai movie. Um, it was like Saw, but with a ghost and in a hospital. It was like wild. But... Mr. Will H. Hayes, who was the president of the Motion Picture Producers and Distributors of America, or the MPPDA, from 1922 to 1944, if he was sitting there watching that film, would have had a literal heart attack. Now, to be fair, Sick Narcissus is not an American film and wouldn't fall under the bylaws of our code, but it definitely wouldn't have been welcomed for distribution in the U.S., especially when uh, theaters were owned by studios. 
The entrance of more mature visuals and ideas wouldn't come until 1968 with the introduction of the MPA rating system that we know today. G, PG, PG-13, R, and NC-17. But that was gradual. Now, before all of this, specifically from 1930 until 1968, all film was required to follow the industry guidelines known as the Motion Picture Production Code. Okay, so boom, it's 1922. People have figured out how to use cameras. They're using them to make all sorts of crazy stuff. They're making cool stuff, but also crazy stuff. And in Hollywood, early Hollywood, there was like sex scandals going on, people get, getting unalived, um, women were getting assaulted, all like no bueno. And a bunch of state legislators each wanted to make up their own rules about what kinds of movies could play in their state, right? Which is a lot for film studios to have to keep up with every time they make a film. Imagine you make a film and instead of just you know, knowing these are the things that I should have, these are the things I shouldn't have. You have to look at each state that you want your film to be distributed in and figure out what you can allow and what you can't allow and possibly make different versions of the film to allow for that. Um, now, that wasn't happening much at the time because making film was expensive, but that was going to be difficult for anybody who was trying to release a film. So they get together they call Will H. Hayes, who was this Presbyterian Republican dude and wanted to freshen up the film industry's image. So they decided it made more sense to set a common set of rules for all the films to follow and to self-regulate rather than to be at the mercy of potentially thousands of separate decency laws for a bunch of different states. They had already decided back in 1915 that free speech does not include film. So there were already some laws in place, but no sticky ones. So in 1927, Hayes figured that they should start a committee to talk about what should and shouldn't be allowed on screen. So Irving K. Thalberg from MGM, Sol Wurzel from Fox, and E.H. Allen from Paramount got together and made this list. And they called it the Don'ts and be careful. So there are no do's for film because film is supposed to be this liberal medium, but they know what you shouldn't do and what you should maybe watch out for. The don'ts and be careful. This list contained 11 subjects best avoided and 26 to be handled very carefully. Now let's go through the list and I want you to consider how many movies would not exist or would not have been released if these subjects were either not allowed or heavily policed. Okay, so right off rip, pointed profanity in the title or in the text of the dialogue. This includes God, Lord, Jesus, Christ, except for if it's being used like reverently in reference to the God, Lord, Jesus Christ. Um, hell, SOB or son of a bitch, damn, or any other spelling of any other profane word. So like, for instance, like you might not put um, F-U-C-K in the script, but you might put F-A-W-K in the script. And um, they want you to know that we know what that means and you still can't use it, okay? Um, any licentious or suggestive nudity, in fact, or in silhouette and any lecherous or licentious notice thereof by other characters in the film. So you can't be nude, you can't suggest nudity, and no one else in the film can suggest that someone else is nude that they're looking at, okay? Um, number three, the illegal traffic in drugs, obviously. Number four, any inference of sexual perversion, which is a very broad definite, like no one knows what people consider sexual perversion. So that could really be anything. White, number five is white slavery. Now look, okay, I thought what you thought when you hear white slavery, right? But, but, White slavery is another word for prostitution, okay? But, big old butt here, big, big booty butt, 
The reason that it's called white slavery is because it actually really only includes white women. Because sexual violence against non-white women on film is normalized and is fine. Also, there weren't a lot of non-white women in film anyway. So typically when they were being used, it was to represent slaves, natives, servants, um, or people that generally were below what was considered proper. And so using a woman's body or seeing a woman's body wasn't considered um, improper because their bodies weren't proper to begin with. So just something to consider during this uh, lovely Black History Month. Number six, not allowed, miscegenation. Uh, miscegenation is interracial relations. So that is pretty self-explanatory for the time. No interracial relations allowed on film at all. Number seven, no sex hygiene or venereal diseases. So we are not talking about any VD. We are not talking about douche. We are not talking about any ways to take care of our nether regions. Uh, number eight, we're not showing any scenes of actual childbirth. In fact, or in silhouette. So no peeking, um, seeing a shadow behind a curtain of a woman screaming with a big belly and pushing a baby out. None of that. Um, number nine, no children's sex organs. Let's just keep that rule forever. Um, we There are a couple of films that have come out, and I'm sure you guys have heard of them, that are very avant-garde and are considered disturbing because they do fit... Uh, they do uh, feature children's sex organs. I like to stay away from those. So um, even though I know that they're very creative films and like have pushed the boundaries of filmmaking, I like that rule. I'm going to just keep rule number nine in all of my films. No children's sex organs. Thank you very much. Number 10, no ridicule of the clergy. Now, I'm not going to recognize that rule in my films going forward, obviously. One of my favorite movies, actually, this is so stupid, is um, I think it was called Keep the Faith with Ben Stiller and I think Owen Wilson. Oh, no, no, no. It was Edward Norton and Ben Stiller. And they were both like clergy people who fell in love with this with. Maybe it was Gwyneth Paltrow. I'm, I'm not looking up the movie right now, but I think that's how it went. Um, and it's one of my favorite movies. And it, it does actually make fun of clergy people, but like in a very like cute way. That movie would not have been allowed in the 30s, even though it's a very cute movie. Um, so unfortunately, boo, tomato, tomato, tomato. Um, number 11, no willful offense to any nation race or creed so you are not allowed to offend people who are not you know blue blood americans um we want to keep anything about anything that's not american out of our film because we don't want to make anybody feel bad interesting right okay so those are the main 11 rules now be it further absolved, resolved, sorry, that special care can be exercised in the manner in which the following subjects are treated to the end that vulgarity and suggestiveness may be eliminated and that good taste may be emphasized. So basically, you know, these are not, you don't talk about these, but listen, if you talk about these in a way that we don't like, we're going to tell you we don't like them. Okay. So first off, the use of the flag. Second, international relations. Generally avoid picturing, picturizing in an unfavorable light another country's religion, history, institutions, prominent people, and citizenry. So because we didn't have the access to information that we have now, um, the film industry was basically like, and these men were basically like, um, just don't talk about things you don't know about. Let's just talk about what's going on over here. Don't, and especially like, don't talk bad about nobody because like we don't have access to the information to know if it's really bad. So let's just not talk about it. And I agree with that mindset, especially for the time. So thank y'all. Um, also, arson. Don't feature arson. Um, don't feature the use of firearms. Theft, robbery, safe cracking, and dynamiting of trains, mines, buildings, etc. Having in mind the effect which a too detailed description of these may have upon the moron. Now, this made me laugh, right? 
So this is basically saying, like, we can't show this because if we show people on film how to do it, some dummies might actually go and do it, which we know now that people blame media for crimes all the time, but they were thinking about people blaming media for the cr- for crimes way back in 1920. Like, it's a wild the way that we have evolved, but nothing has changed. Um, next, you can't talk about brutality or can't show any brutality or possible gruesomeness. So nothing gross, um, nothing that's overly violent. Um, no technique of committing murder by whatever method. So we are not showing people how to kill people. We are not showing people methods of smuggling. Um, we're not showing people third degree methods, which actually means torture. So not showing people how to torture people. We're not showing actual hangings or electrocutions as legal punishments for crime. Um, we're not showing sympathy for criminals which is a huge part of film today, making the villain uh, sort of a sympathetic villain. Like that's a, that's huge. So, wow. Um, Attitude towards public characters and institutions. So you gotta like, you can't have an opinion one way or the other about the president or have an opinion one way or the other about the mayor of your town or about the church. You can't have an opinion about things that other people can have opinions on that actually exist. Okay. Um, can't really feature too much sedition, which is starting a rebellion. So you can't really feature starting a rebellion in a film unless it's a historical account of something that happened, right? Um, no apparent cruelty to children and animals. That makes sense. No branding of people or animals. That makes sense. No sale of women or women selling their virtue. So we're looking at white slavery as uh, like a woman selling herself, right? That's prostitution. This is saying that you can't show any women selling herself or selling something that would make a man want to be with her. So um, that is beyond prostitution. That's even like a woman trying to use her body to get married or a woman using her body to generally get something that she wants. Okay. No rape or attempted rape. No first night scenes. So no consummation of marriage. No um, meeting someone, falling in love and being like, all right, let's get it. Let's get it in the first night that we met at the bar. Let's get it in the first night that we met at the club. So, and you know how often that happens in film and in TV where somebody will just meet somebody and go home with them. None of that would be allowed. Wild. (laughs) That's like a third of the content that we get where somebody goes home with somebody and immediately has sex with them. Anyway, you also can't show a man and a woman in bed together, which is why they often had separate beds or a scene would start with one person on the bed and one person off. Never both on the bed, even if an affair affair was implied. Like you remember when we talked about Psycho and at the beginning, um, the couple um, was like, kind of uh, getting up from a tryst, an afternoon tryst at the hotel. But um, one of them was standing, putting on their clothes while the other one was still laying in the bed. They are both not allowed. And this was 1960 when things were starting to loosen up. We'll talk about that later, but not allowed. Okay. That's also why you see a lot of scenes in older movies where people are kissing and you got the kiss dip which, you know, people are standing and kissing and they'll dip the girl. So it's sort of like they're in a laying down motion, but not going to lay down on anything. Or you'll see a lot of scenes with people cuddling and kissing on love seats because a couch or a love seat is similar to a bed, but you definitely can't recline or relax or be as active as you could in a bed. Um, 
Next, can't talk about the deliberate seduction of girls. So a man could be a certain kind of man and a woman could just swoon and fall in love with him, which is what you often saw happen in movies, but you couldn't have a man who was directly trying to get a woman to come to bed with him or trying to get a woman to be into him, which is also really crazy because when you watch a lot of these old movies, not knowing this code, you would think that like these men are just the most um, handsome and charming men in the world, even when they're slapping women around and yelling and not having boundaries and not having proper hold on their emotion. But these women are just swooning over them. It's because the code said that's what had to happen. (laughs) It's really funny. Um, You have to be really careful with talking about the institution of marriage. Very careful with surgical operations, right? Very careful with the use of drugs. It had to be, um, there had to be some reason for the drugs to be featured in the film, maybe to a negative end for one of the um, characters or because it was something historical. But you couldn't just have people, it couldn't be SLC punk. You know what I'm saying? You can't just have people shooting up in a movie just because it's cool or because it's fun to eat. Euphoria had no chance. That's what that's what I'm saying. Euphoria. Well, maybe because they do show that it's not glamorous. It's starting to show that it's not glamorous, but still, I don't know if Euphoria would have got past these. I mean, they definitely would have. Everything that we just talked about, I think, is featured in Euphoria at some point. Anyway. Um, any titles or scenes having to do with law enforcement or law enforcing officers should be treated with care. And finally, any excessive or lustful kissing, particular when one character or the other is a heavy, which is a criminal. So criminals do not deserve, um, very passionate kisses. Um, they should just be out committing crimes and getting arrested for those crimes. They do not deserve to get poon in the meantime, which, as we all know, in most movies, criminals are getting the most poon out of everyone because that's just how criminals work. Well, maybe not in like Home Alone. They were not trying to get poon. They were just trying to break into a house and a child prevented them from doing it. But, you know, in most like, you know, if you think about like John Wick or something like that, the criminal always is surrounded by a bunch of women are trying to give him poon so none of those movies would have been allowed in this time all the things that i just named pretty much make up like every quentin tarantino movie as well like quentin tarantino could not possibly exist in this time insane i think there was like a seven second rule for kissing or something like that i can never find it but i heard something or read something about it where like you could I think you could kiss up to seven seconds without a break between the kissing. And then it had to turn into like a loving embrace or kisses on the cheek or something. So you'll often see these scenes of people kissing very passionately and all of a sudden they break and they start hugging each other and and start dialogue or just start like grabbing each other like passionately. Um, Like they can't stop hugging each other. It's because they couldn't kiss for too long. Now, okay. So you got all the rules, all all the whole code I just went over for you. After all that, in 1929, a Catholic layman named Martin Quigley and a Jesuit priest named Father Daniel A. Lord, possibly the most religious name in the world, Daniel A. Father Daniel A. Lord. Wow. Wow. You just were, if you did not become a priest, I don't know what your job is. You can't be a lawyer named Father, well, his name isn't Father, but you can't be a lawyer named Daniel A. Lord. I don't know, or maybe you could, but anyway, so these two people, Martin Quigley and Father Daniel A. Lord, they created a code for the studios to review too. You see, they had the wee babes in mind and wanted to make sure that films were good for the kids. So, like, the rules don't say anything about homosexuality, but, like, it's implied that we're just not going to talk about that. Any kind of cheating or relations outside of marriage in a film could not be sexy because that's not, you know, supporting good morals. Nothing that would make anybody want to cheat. Any crime, also in in film, any crime had to be punished. 
And filmmakers couldn't do anything to make you sympathize with the criminal unless the criminal perform, reformed their ways and became good, but no sympathy for the devil. So for instance, um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I recorded the first episode of Antonio Palacio's new podcast, the cult worthy classic with him. And we talked about um, The Bad Seed, which is an amazing film. And uh, I'm going to link that episode in the show notes so that you guys will get to listen to that. Um, hopefully you like it. But um, in the stage version of The Bad Seed, um, the main character or the main antagonist, I guess, at the end of it, she gets to go on and kind of like live her life. And uh, at the end of the film, I'm not going to give it away, but that is not what happens to her. So um, the film had to um, correct that in order to be able to release it. Otherwise, it goes against the code. Also, authority figures could be villains, right? But it had to be very clear that this was an individual choice and not a product of the institution. So some bad cops could definitely collect a bribe, but not because the police department is crooked. Just those specific guys are crooked. Um, another rule was clergy could never be villains, ever. No instance where a religious person has a bad bone in their body. There was also an addendum to the code that said that companies couldn't advertise in film either. So um, that's why a lot of times when you see people doing things, you don't really see the product. You see them with a bottle or you see them, especially with like liquors. Um, this is something that I've noticed about uh film recently um and a lot of times in old films you'd have people who had these bars set up and you know you have bar carts or a, a bar cabinet and so they'd have all their liquor transferred into these nice bottles so that they could serve it so you'd never have to show the bottle now in film a lot people will still have these bar carts but the liquor is like out so you can tell it's like a sponsorship but typically if you get a bar cart especially these people who have like really nice houses and have really nice glasses you would typically have really nice containers to keep your spirits in and um I think it's interesting when you watch all of these old films you'll see people with these elaborate bar carts with beautiful um uh transfer bottles um and you don't see that as you see that sometimes still but not as much anymore because people there's so much advertising that goes on um but the basically now the film industry is actually is practically being controlled by the church right but film itself is a liberal medium where people are allowed to be creative and experience experiment but now it's within the confines of what the church and what these people consider morality. So the way it worked was uh, each studio uh, would have to submit their script to Hayes' office, who would read these scripts as they came in and would mark the things that had to be taken out or that they would suggest to be taken out. But the office didn't really have like authority so they would just have to reason with these people and sometimes beg these studios to take things out. Like it wasn't a law that like now that we've created this code, you can't have this stuff in the movie, but they just wanted people to ha keep the public in mind. Um, and the studio had the final say over what they put out anyway. So imagine if you like, it, it's the equivalent of like if you were speeding and a cop pulls you over and was like, hey, you're speeding. Um, this is a 35 mile zone. You were going 40. I'm going to give you a ticket because you shouldn't go 40 in a 35. And you're like, well, nobody was around and it wasn't even really that bad. Um, uh, so I think it's okay that I went 40. And the cop is like, listen, like, what if a kid just ran out into the middle of the street? Like, you can't just be going 40. And so they try to reason with you. And at the end of the day, you go like, mm, okay, well, I get what you're saying, but also I'm still probably going to go 40 and I'm not going to pay this ticket. And then you just put it in your center console and never worry about it ever again. And you continue to do drive 40 through the street. Pretty much that's what these <laughs> studios 
had the power to do. They still had to talk to them and talk through why they wanted to include the stuff in the film. But at the end of the day, um, these they could put through whatever they wanted. And they couldn't really stop them. So when Jason Joy was in charge until 1932, he would kind of help these studios with rewrites and making things work within the parameters of the code, which eventually led him to getting a job writing at Fox. His successor, Dr. James Wingate, was not good at that. And he was slow. Like, not, you know, mentally slow, but he would... He was slow at going through scripts, so a lot of stuff would just get passed because he didn't have the time or the energy to read what was up to 500 scripts per year. Now, he had a team, but 500 scripts per year is more than one per day to read a whole script. That's like if you were asked to read a book a day for chow, cheese and chips. I can't. Now, outside of all of that, the Great Depression started in 1930 and studios needed money and people have not changed, even though we feel like they have. So people still wanted to see the risque, racy stuff that brings people to the theaters. So studios were putting out racy content because they knew it would bring in crowds. Now, for context, I need you to understand that this is 1930 now. In 1896, just 34 years prior, the Catholic Church uh, wanted a movie called The Kiss Band. This was an 18-second clip of a couple cuddled up on a love seat, and they quickly kiss on the cheeks, I mean, on the lips. Kissing in public was illegal at the time. So when I say racy content, I mean, like, sometimes there were scenes where criminals were likable, or there were scenes where people were kissing and seemed very passionate, Um, or a person couldn't have a god complex in the film. And in the 1931 version of Frankenstein, the doctor says, now I know what it feels like to be god. That was a big no-no for the time, but they put it in the film because it was sort of breaking the code. One of my favorite films and one of the first old films that I watched um, in a technical aspect. It happened one night with Clark Gable and Claudette Colbert was released right before they started enforcing the code. And um, that film would not have been up to scruff. We're we're definitely going to be discussing it very soon, so I don't want to give away what happens, but for a film that seems very cheeky, innocent, and cute now, it was very suggestive and really immoral from the standpoint of the church. Now, Another popular method that filmmakers were using and actually still use today is putting in ridiculous content that they know will be cut in order to trick the censors into leaving lesser offenses in. So if you had an excessively long kiss, that may be lewd on its own, right? But if you throw in a couple of gunfights, a prostitute, and a robbery that you don't really need, that kiss is probably going to slip under the radar. Um... More recently, I heard a story, I'm not sure if it's 100% true, but um, the movie This Is The End with Seth Rogen and Jay Barshell and virtually everybody else in life that came out in 2013. So they knew that they had some risque stuff in the script um, that could definitely get them pushed over to NC-17, which is sort of considered a death sentence, especially for movies that are supposed to be marketed for for teens or young adults. So they threw a bunch of stuff in in this movie, including there was like a huge like demon and it had like a huge penis. Um, So they threw in this huge demon penis thinking that it would be like the first thing they'd cut. And there were a couple other things that they thought would be cut and they were shocked to find out that everything that they put in that film had been let through at an R rating. So they didn't have to cut anything. And they put excessive amounts of things in the film as a protection. So I'm sure 
that with the small teams at the PCA back in the 1930s, now you have thousands of hundreds of people, thousands of people who work in these TV screening um, facilities and will go through the film and like monitor for certain things. Back then, it was like these small teams at the PCA. I'm sure a ton of stuff slipped through the cracks at the time. On one side of things, there were like empowered women, homosexual characters, bisexual characters, um, characters really finding their strength in different ways that slipped on through. But there was also mad racism and rape and adultery. And not in a way that provided like commentary or an interesting point of view that could be discussed. It was literally just inserted because it was fun and added to the allure of the film for audiences and would bring more people in. So, you know, plus minus on breaking the code. Then in 1934, an amendment to the code was made that said that all films had to be approved before they were released. So before people were submitting their scripts, you'd rewrite the script and then you could kind of do whatever you were going to do, right? Now they're saying, um, you, we have to see the film before you put it out. Um, so Joseph Breen, a Catholic layman, took over as the head of the new PCA, the new Production Code Administration, and Breen did not play. He even made Betty Boop change clothes. So in older um, uh, showings of Betty Boop, she had this like cute little flapper dress on. But if you see in the 1930s, the evolution of Betty Boop, she had on like this housewife sort of dress. And Buddy made people mad, okay? Brain was upsetting people, but he was also influential in making some of the films that we know and love what they are. For instance, we talked about Casablanca for a few weeks ago, right? Without the code, Rick and Ilsa could have run off together. And then the ending becomes way more messy, something more convoluted. And like, I know it may have made it more interesting, but that clean, perfect ending that we get that makes the movie what it is, is in part due to Breen's strict code of morals. Now, on the other hand, The Outlaw by Howard Hughes was finished in 1941 but didn't get released until 1943 because Breen thought that Jane Russell's titties were too prominent in the advertising. Like, first of all, Jane Russell is fine as hell, okay? You should be looking at her face no matter where the camera seems to be. Like, face card never declines for Jane Russell, babe. But really, it was just that she had on sort of like a low-cut shirt. Y'all, like... Kept, she, this movie was kept out of theaters for two years over the mere suggestion of boobs. It wasn't even showing her boobs all the way. Just a suggestion of boobs. Also, you know that rule about not talking about other nations? Well, the PCA was not allowing for any anti-Nazi films. And that probably sounds a bit strange and you're probably like, okay, excuse me? But this was the 1930s, before World War II, and before the Nazis that we know as the Nazis would roll through. However, in 1938, which was still before World War II, um, once the FBI prosecuted a Nazi spy ring in America, then they started letting studios produce anti-Nazi films and... <clears throat> One of those early anti-Nazi films was actually a Three Stooges film, which is funny that one of the first um, uh, films that came out about uh, this horrible group of people was the Three Stooges, making them look like idiots. Um, anyway, a lot of films at the time were based on existing properties like books and plays, which featured a lot of the subject matters that were prohibited for film. Right now, you know, you got writers who were exploring like really taboo, deep subjects for their time. And the weakest of filmmakers and writers would just simply re remove that stuff. Okay. Boo, tomato, tomato, tomato. 
the renegades of the filmmakers, like our like somebody like Otto Preminger would try to slip it by or get around it, try to justify it, especially filmmakers outside of the mainstream studios. The most creative of them would find interesting ways to make the point without making the point. For instance, like uh, a woman dressed in a nightgown next to a man in a robe. We know they sleep or have slept together. Hearing the screams of someone off screen and seeing smoke. Someone is being burned alive. The sound of a hinge and a, a door followed by a heavy dropping sound. Someone just got hung. You don't have to show it to know it. But then the 1950s came with television. So now studios have to figure out how to get people to leave the house to come see movies. And with these strict ass codes, like you may as well just stay home and watch whatever's on TV, right? Now TV had even stricter codes than the films, but at least in film, you could kind of figure out a way to get around it. So we got to get loose on some of these codes at this point. Also, in the 50s, foreign films were starting to find their stride. And since now, um, there was a court case that said that studios couldn't legally own theaters anymore, they couldn't stop these foreign films from releasing or showing in America. And they weren't the these foreign films weren't subject to the same regulations as American film. So people were spending their money to see something new and refreshing and different, right? Then 1952, it was determined that film indeed did fall under the First Amendment, freedom of speech. Plus, it's the 50s now. Even though culture is still pretty tame, adultery, prostitution, and even interracial relationships had seeped into American cultures, so there's no way to keep it out of film, right? When Billy Wilder's Some Like It Hot came out, the MPAA would not approve it, and they released it anyway and it was wildly successful so now people can see that these rules are weak sauce right and it feels like the 1950s were super tame i know when we look back at it but compared to the 1930s the 50s were really revolutionary there were also directors trying to do away with these codes like we mentioned earlier otto preminger he was making risque movies about drug use homosexuality and sexual assault and of course these were all forbidden by the code however his films were so creative artistic um forward thinking that they were often allowed through with of course some changes um and a lot of films went through this as well too they kind of had to rethink what they thought of as acceptable for the code because times have changed teenagers have changed and a big part of your movie going audience is going to be teens right now by the 60s y'all it was the 60s there was boobs 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 everywhere right there were literal serial killers in existence that people knew about. Keeping the activity out of the film wasn't stopping it. It was only keeping people from discussing it outside of real life happenings. No one is talking about assault, rape, murder, theft, the human condition, until something happens in real life to provoke a conversation. And even then, the conversations are uncomfortable because these aren't things that are being discussed in a way that gives you multiple perspectives. Part of the joy of film is being able to discuss the what ifs of life without having to experience them. Because some of those what ifs are mad uncomfy. Some of those what ifs are even deadly. And being able to experience them visually and experience them mentally without having to experience them physically is one of the things that can help us cope with life. And film and different mediums are able to do that. And the 50s, I mean, uh, the production code was generally suppressing that until now. Anyway, they were having a hard time enforcing this code as society changed, of course. Then, jump forward to 1966 when Warner Brothers released Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf with my boo, Elizabeth Taylor, and her then boo, Richard Burton. There was a lot going on. 
because it was a based on a stage play where all of the dialogue kind of lends to the tone of the work, but the dialogue was a little bit snappy and risque. So instead of doing a bunch of edits, they just did a few, but they stamped it with a new tag, SMA, Suggested for Mature Audiences, 1966. So now that they have this label, they don't have to classify films so hard because it can either be for mature audiences or not. Yay! Now in the late 60s, when clearly they weren't controlling anything, the code was scratched and they decided to come out with four ratings at this point, right? G for general exhibition, M is suggested for mature audiences, R restricted under 16 against unless accompanied by an adult, and X, no one under 16. So you may be saying, well, rated M, what is a mature audience if it's not over 16, right? Well, yeah, the M was confusing for everyone. So they changed the rating to GP, meaning general exhibition, but parental guidance is suggested, which was officially changed to PG in 1972. Then in the 80s, people were like, okay, but there's a difference in stuff that's not suitable for like an eight-year-old and stuff that's not suitable for a 14-year-old, right? Like, for instance, like poltergeist or gremlins, not too bad if you're 15, but if you were 10, it might be terrifying. Hence, PG-13 was born. Eventually, the letter X in association with film has a certain connotation, if you get my drift, especially when there are three X's in a row. So no film wanted an X rating. But there had to be some films for just adults. So then they adjusted it to NC-17. Now, an NC-17 rating used to suck. It kind of sucked up until like really recently, actually. Because with NC-17, because it wasn't allowed for general audiences, you couldn't play the trailers in theaters. You couldn't really advertise for it because not everyone could see it. And then... Back in the day, and really up until recently, half of your movie market was families and teens. And the movies were seldom like a date night for adults because at the time, if you think about the 50s and the 60s, sure, you could go to the movie sometimes, but there were like bars, clubs, dance joints. There was new music coming out all the time. There were general house parties happening everywhere where you just lounge around in someone's house or someone's basement looking fabulous. Going to the movies wasn't an over-17 thing wasn't necessarily an adult thing unless the movie really gripped you in. So naturally, the MPAA has become a lot more laxed in what they allow in R-rated films now, right? Now that we can see trailers online and we can get film news online and we can find out about the biggest to the smallest of films with the push of a button, uh, these rating systems don't really have as much weight as they used to, especially considering uh, once a film comes out for streaming or um, for watch on uh, some kind of rentable service, you can get access to it, you know, without an ID. I mean, of course, like there, are, if you have a setting where your kids can't access certain movies or certain people in the house can't access certain things, of course, you can protect them that way. But that's the only protection you have. Um, if I was, you know, 13 years old, I, I think about like, I just saw Titan recently, which is um, an insanely good movie, but also has some very crazy visuals and very crazy plot. My mom didn't know how to put protections on the TV so I couldn't watch certain things. So if I was 12 or 13 and that movie came out and it was on TV, I could have watched it as a 13-year-old. The amount of movies that I watched, um, even having access to cable because they would come on cable and cable doesn't know who's watching it. 
um, those rating systems really only work effectively when the film is coming out at the movie theater. After that, it is sort of um, the Wild West for dictating who can and can't see a film. Another rating that you may commonly see is unrated, which is obviously not a rating. Uh, this happens when a filmmaker or a studio decides not to submit for a rating. Um, it usually it has the same weight as being NC-17 as far as being allowed in a movie theater. But this usually you see this with like director's cuts or with smaller studios who just don't have uh, the funds or the backing to put it through the ratings process. So um, just like uh, with NC-17 films, unrated films, if associated with the right director or actors or filmmakers or properties, it doesn't matter if it's unrated, people will still watch it, and people will still see it, and you can still get access to it. Um, so this rating system is really like a guideline or a code, as some would say, for people, but it doesn't mean as much as we think it means, especially because they've reweighted what is allowed and what isn't allowed in movies based on how much money the film industry can make based off of those films. I know you've probably seen some uh, jokes in uh, some Marvel films or some animated films that you knew were uh, sort of uh, pushed towards adults, some more adult humor. And you may recognize it as adult humor and may recognize, hey, this isn't something that maybe should be in a PG-13 movie. But it has to be in that PG-13 movie because there has to be something for your 13-year-old to enjoy. And there also has to be something there that's going to make you want to go see those movies multiple times. So um, they allow in more of that R-rated content or what we would consider to be R-rated content so that... Um, there's more people that are compelled to go see the film and ultimately they can make more money. Another great change that we've seen is back in the day, if you did an avant-garde film, if you did something that was kind of risque, maybe you took your clothes off, maybe you played a role that was a little bit <clears throat> off the beaten path, um, it could end your film career. You could never be in a film again. Now in 2022, your first role could be um, some really interesting film and can land you critical acclaim, could land you other opportunities because people see how, what lengths and what depths you are willing to go through for a film. So in general, um, I just wanted to provide some perspective uh, on why films are the way that they are or were the way that they were. And not because they were a bunch of prudes in Hollywood and not because they didn't recognize that sex and crime and drugs were a part of life, but because a few prudes, specifically a few religious prudes, made the rules that Hollywood had to live by for about 30 years. Now, if you look between the lines of a lot of these vintage films, you'll find subtext that you never even realized was there, hidden between those whimsical voices and weird words because they were worried about the code. Now, going forward, I'll be on the lookout for things that break the code, as they say, and I may point out a few of them for you as we talk about our films. And um, when you have that many broad rules, it's hard not to break at least one, so I'm sure we'll find some code breaks in every film that we watch. And we'll also be covering some films that found some really slick ways to get away with tight rules. Um, and you'll really get an idea as we go forward of how creative some of these filmmakers and writers really were in such a conservative time. Well, that's all the time we have for today, guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I know this was more informational than movie-based, but um, I think it does provide some context about why movies seem so different and weird and from another time um, and who was controlling what at that time to make movies that way. Well, next week, I'm going to have a little Valentine's Day gift for you. And we are getting animated with it. I don't know if that'll give you a clue of what we're doing, but hopefully it will. Uh, <laughs> you can follow the podcast on whatever platform you are using. I definitely recommend um, Apple Pods, of course. There's also Good Pods or Pod Chaser, which are specifically for podcasts. 
Um, and um, I have not been updating my YouTube, but I'm going to get my YouTube updated so that you guys can hopefully start listening to me on YouTube as well. Um, please follow the podcast um, uh, at the Life Pod Instagram. Follow me on Twitter at film underscore Nikki and send any collab requests, advice, movie recommendations, um, any of that general greetings to here's looking podcast at gmail.com. I also do have a link still to buy me a coffee if you guys want to get me a drink. Um, and <laughs> um, I. I guess I could maybe post my cash app or something in there because I have had a couple of people ask me if they can donate to the pod in some way. Um, so I can post my cash app as well. But hopefully you guys enjoyed this episode. Um, I'm not going to do a ton of these informational episodes, but there will be a couple just to give you guys some context into things that um, may affect your listening of the pod. But uh As we end things, of course, I thank you for tuning in. And if I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Cheers.